Good morning, students. Uh, today I want to be discussing quickly European imperialism in Africa. By the time we get to the 19th century, Europe's going to be colonizing as much of the world as they possibly can. Now, the question sort of asks, why is it going to be Africa at this point? Well, if we take a look at the rest of the world, uh, it, basically Africa became the only place left that they could colonize. By the 19th century, as, as we've already looked at, the Americas were almost completely independent with the various uh, wars of independence fought against Spain the British, for example, France. Uh, you know, by the mid-19th century, China was also being abused by the West, particularly during the Opium Wars, which you know, led to the spheres of influence by eight industrial powers that carved up China for uh, part of their colonialism. If we also look at some of the other regions of the world, you know, Australia began to be colonized as early as the 17th century, and full control by the Europeans, particularly the British, uh, came in Australia by the end of the 18th century. By the mid to late 19th century, you see the United States, Germany, Japan, all competing for control over the remainder of Oceania. So by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, Africa was really the only place left for Europeans to expand their empires. And in the process, they are going to have something what we now call the scramble for Africa. Now before we even get to that point, understand that Africa was a part of the global community as long as if not longer than any other region. Uh, they were involved in both Indian Ocean trade as well as Mediterranean trade networks. There's also theories that suggest African traders made their way to the Americas, as evidenced by the Olmec heads. Now, they became an integral, well, Africa that is, became an integral part of the climate exchange, especially with West Africa's inclusion into triangular trade, looking at the Middle Passage delivering slaves throughout the Western Hemisphere. Now, as I mentioned a minute ago, the coastline of Africa began to have colonies, particularly the Portuguese and the Dutch, as they built their trading post empires. Um, and then by 1870s, though, this is where the, the idea of the scramble for Africa is really going to take on, um, take on its, its most serious role within African history. So by the 1870s, King Leopold, uh, King Leopold II of Belgium basically established the area of what is the Congo as his own personal fiefdom. Basically, he took an area about the third the size of the continental United States and claimed it as his own personal property. Now, instead of Europeans coming together to condemn the action of Leopold and the slave-like uh, slave conditions that were being established in the Congo, in 1884 to 85, Europeans convened at what is now called the Berlin Conference. Now, at the Berlin Con Conference, Europeans basically decided they wanted to get in on the imperial action of Africa in a gentlemanly sort of manner, and they carved out which nations, which European nations got what territories of Africa. <clears throat> and so this scramble for Africa began with the British taking the most, followed closely by the French. Others involved included the Portuguese and the Spanish along the west coast, though Portugal will also own uh, Mozambique along the east coast. As already stated, Belgium, they were in the center, and they were without a doubt the most brutal of the colonizers. More than 5 million people are going to die in the Congo alone as a result of slave labor as they extracted resources. You're also going to see alterations solidifying distinctions between uh, the two ethnic groups, the Hutu and the Tutsi. But we'll cover this modern problem at a later date. Germany, they were also involved and dispersed in several locations including Namibia, Cameroon, and Tanzania. Italy took Libya and much of the Horn of Africa but Ethiopia maintained its independence. The Dutch, they were also in southern Africa, so the Netherlands, but they would systematically lose its control over the first and second Anglo-Boer Wars fought between the British, and the British obviously emerged on top. So if we just take a look, you're going to see the British, French, Portuguese, Spanish, German, Dutch, Belgians. They're all going to be involved in the scramble for Africa. Now, the colonization over Africa is going to be different than China. Now, if we recall back, Britain is basically the only ones dictating the terms there. Uh, again, with the opium trade, first opium war, second opium war, uh, support of the Qing dynasty during the Taiping Rebellion, the spheres of influence, the suppression of Chinese nationalism during the Boxer Rebellion. But others are going to be there, but they are not going to play as prominent a role as the English did, the British did. Something else we need to look at, how the colonization of Africa is going to be different than, say, the colonization of China around the same time, is China was a large developed civilization, whereas in Africa, geography never really supported that. Um, 
what you're going to see in Africa, there's you know something that's very important as you're building civilizations. You want to be building near water, right? Build near rivers, build near lakes, build near ponds. And the thing is with Africa, they've got a lot of mosquitoes, which carry malaria. And so the Africans, throughout their history, um, they were smart enough to realize that you can't, in Africa at least, be building near water. They would build close enough within walking distance, but you know their their uh, their homes were not within the high mosquito areas. They were in higher elevations and uh, further away from the water, which led to uh, greater stability as far as health is concerned in Africa. But not building near water, you're not going to see the same kind of uh, cities being developed in other parts of the world. Uh, one of the things, though, that's going to happen as Europeans begin to arrive in Africa, they're going to look at this and say, boy, Africans are stupid. They're building their towns not near water, silly Africans. And so they subject the Africans to move their towns, their cities, right next to water, which today has, lead, has led to a, a malaria being the number one killer of children under the age of five. It is uh, It kills more people than any war has ever done. And that's because the cities are going to be moved from uh, from the lower exposure areas to higher exposure areas as a result of European imperialism. Even though Africa didn't really have the same kind of civilization as, say, the Chinese, they are going to have a lot of grand civilizations throughout its history. Now, the Aksum Empire in modern-day Ethiopia, there's the Kingdom of Congo, uh, there's also the Mali, Ghana, and Songhai in West Africa. And the southern portion this is going to be relevant for the, the scrim for Africa was the Zulu. They're perhaps one of the most powerful militaries, at least of, of uh, the 19th century. But yet they too are going to be conquered by the Europeans. Now the question is why? How is it going to be possible if you've got a large uh, military with great warriors? Well, they had very limited technology. They had some guns, but it was largely the only ones that they were able to capture uh, from the British or the Dutch. And so the primary weapons that they still had were spears and a shield. And at this point in time, by the end of the 19th century, the British were fielding Maxim machine guns in battle. And so spear and shield is not going to win over machine gun, with a few exceptions, and I'll mention one a little bit later on. Uh, as far as South Africa is concerned, the colonization there, you know, I, I'm not going to get into the specifics of this because this video is going to be long enough as it is. But understand that the British, the Dutch, and the Zulu are going to be competing for control over the region of Southern Africa, or South Africa today. And ultimately, the Zulu, while they were some of the greatest warriors of the world at the time, you can't defeat them using machine guns. Now, uh, the, the Anglo-Zulu War of 1879, you're going to see a number of different battles. Uh, one of the most interesting ones, I'm just going to mention it very briefly, is the Battle of Izand Lawana, where you're going to see... Uh, tens of thousands of Zulu going up a couple of uh, a little over a thousand British soldiers. Now the British entered uh, the Zulu lands very arrogantly thinking well we're fighting Africans they just have spears and we've got machine guns and they set up their camp in a valley. It doesn't take a genius to figure out setting up a camp in a valley is not a good thing in a time of war. So the Zulu ended up using the surrounding hills to sneak up on the British and then used human wave tactics to overrun their position and crush them. Uh, that's going to be really the only victory for the Zulu during the Anglo-Zulu War. From that point forward, the British are going to take the Zulu seriously and actually use um, some of the more modern tactics to defend their positions. Ultimately, though, uh, the, the British will defeat the Zulu, and so it's going to leave uh, two more groups remaining in, in southern Africa, and that's, again, still the British, as well as the Dutch, who... Uh, the, lo the local Dutch spoke a version of German, which is now known as Afrikaans, and whose word for farmer was boar. And so when you get to the point of the British and Dutch fighting, they're known as the First and Second Anglo-Boer Wars. I'm not going to get into the specifics of those, but what you end up seeing is um, the, the British winning both of these. And so by at the beginning of the 20th century, the British are going to have sole control over uh, South Africa. And I'm only mentioning this now because we will look at South Africa later on down the road. <clears throat> now, one of the biggest problems that you're going to see, besides the fact that Europeans are going to alter uh, the way 
towns were built and, and move those towards uh, water. So again, you're going to see the rise of malaria uh, deaths in, in Africa as a result of this. But you're also going to see another serious problem popping up in the colonialism and imperialism of Africa. And that's going to be artificial boundaries. So you're going to see all these powerful European powers come along saying, hey, congratulations, you are now Nigeria or Sudan or Rwanda or Namibia. And they're just going to go and instead of taking into account uh, long-standing rivalries, uh, hatred, cultures, uh, they're, they're just going to lump them together in sort of an unrepresentative mass of some of these nations. And you can see you know, in some of these places where there you know, may have been 200 different groups and they're now all of a sudden going to be considered, say, Nigerian. And that's not going to bode well down the road. Uh, especially when we look at the age of some of these nations when they earn their independence. Most of them are younger than my dad. And, you know, I like to pick on my father for being old, but it's still, most of these countries aren't going to earn their independence until the late 1950s, early 1960s. Uh, Eritrea is going to be the last one to get their independence, really, until, it's not going to be until 1993, within my lifetime. Um, so what you're going to see is... Uh, these artificial boundaries are going to lead to a lot of problems down the road, especially during the point where they're fighting for their independence in the middle of the 20th century. So the idea of nationalism in Africa isn't going to have the same kind of pull as it will have in, say, China or Japan or Europe or the Americas. Uh, just as a quick example, you know, as your history teacher, imagine that I'm your imperial ruler. Now, let's say two weeks before the SOL or the AP exam, I say that I'm leaving and there's not going to be a teacher that's going to replace me. So, good luck to all of you, but don't worry. You're all World II students of mine, formerly. And so at that point in time, you'll be okay. So forget who you are. Forget that you might be a Smith or Jones or whatever it might be. Forget you might be a farmer who's, who's been farming in, in the southern end of the county all uh, since the 1800s or whatever. Forget all that, and now you are all former Obracta students in room 210. How do you think it's going to work out for you? Well, it really doesn't. You're also going to see artificial groupings based upon race, and again, you're going to see the Belgians being by far the worst offenders of this, and they're going to go and divide the Hutu and the Tutsi, which existed. They, they recognized themselves as Hutu or Tutsi. Now, the Hutu, they were the um, ones who were sedentary farmers. They... Uh, had that kind of a, a lifestyle. They were a larger percentage of, of the population within the region of like southern Uganda, um, eastern Congo, uh, Rwanda, Burundi. And so what you end up seeing is the, the Hutu being farmers and the Tutsis being the pastoral herders. And ultimately as the Belgians came in, they're going to say, hey, Tutsis, you're you look more European, you're taller, your thinner noses, and your skin is a little bit lighter, so therefore you're more European and more fit to rule over the Hutus. And so they're going to establish uh, sort of the, the long hand of, of Belgium, or the Belgian government is going to be the, the Tutsis. And as I already said, the Belgians were by far the worst offenders of, of uh, human rights during the scramble for Africa and African colonization. So, you know, as they establish uh, and solidify some of these tensions between the Hutu and the Tutsi is going to lead to things like the Rwandan genocide and, and the genocide in Burundi and the continued violence uh, to this day in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, so basically, as we look up, as I, as I want to quickly summarize, Europeans, as they came in during the scramble for, for Africa as a result of the Berlin Conference, they're going to interrupt a system of life that had worked for several millennia and impose their system over them. And within less than 100 years of this colonialism and imperialism, these nations are going to get their independence. So several thousand years of history gone in less than 100. And that's one of the reasons why today Africa has a lot of the problems that it does. Uh, we'll look at some of these, some of these instances upon, um, at a later date and some of the instances of nationalism and wars of independence. We'll look at this at a later date. So thank you for watching and hopefully see you folks tomorrow.